Every year in April, American Mahjong players eagerly await the release of the National Mahjong League card. In this video, I'll show the results of my analysis and share actionable insights, then finish with tips for a smooth transition. If you're new to Mahjong, or if you already know how to play and just want to build your skills, consider subscribing to my channel. That way you won't miss anything. We're going to start with a baseline, then we'll get into nitty gritty analytics and insights, followed by findings with actionable commentary, and we'll end with tips for a smooth transition. Let's start with that baseline. The National Mahjong League publishes their annual card of valid hands for American Mahjong players in April. A new edition of the National Mahjong League guidebook was just published in 2024. However, some of their rulings are not included, so visit the Maj Life Wiki. It's free and on demand. Here, you'll find wiki articles with all the rulings published by the league. The methods used to describe the hands stay the same. The categories of the hands typically stay the same. The changes are in the shapes and patterns of the hands. Let's look at the changes on the back of the card. On the left panel, when talking about the tiles, they've removed WH-white for soap R for red and G for green, probably because they didn't use those descriptors on this year's card. In the game setup, they added when east wall has been depleted, wall to the left is pushed out. Under the Charleston, they rephrase tiles that can be passed to any three tiles may be passed with the exception of jokers. They added that the Charleston may be stopped only after the first left and that the courtesy pass still applies. Incidentally, after the first left, if any players pass the second left and someone looks at those tiles, it's too late to stop the Charleston. They rephrase tiles that can be passed to blind pass of one, two, or three tiles permitted on first, left, and or last right. And they were moved without looking at them, but this still applies. It's called a blind pass because you're not supposed to look at the tiles. There is no penalty though, if you do. Under the section where they describe the beginning of the game, they have that the game begins with East discarding their 14th tile. Players to the right of East pick and discard in turn. Jokers may be discarded and named Joker, Same, or Name of the previous discard. Also, when it's the player's turn, Jokers may be replaced in any exposure whether picked from the wall or in the player's hand. And I added the word valid because you still cannot exchange jokers in an invalid exposure. So that bracketed valid is my edit. Under claiming a discard, they removed no picking or looking ahead, but this rule still applies. They moved the second rule from the middle panel and it says a player must verbalize their call alerting the other players that a claim is being made. The caller may say call, take, I want that, or something similar. If there is a simultaneous call for exposure, the player next in turn gets preference and this is number four. In the middle panel, under misnamed discard, they reordered this section. Under Mahjong in error, 
they removed if a player declares a mahjong in error and exposes part or all of the hand and all other hands are intact. The game continues, but the declarer's hand is no longer viable. They're disqualified. The same penalty applies for calling a discard and making an incorrect exposure. The disqualified player discontinues playing and does not pick or discard, but must pay any subsequent winner the value of the hand. So even though they removed this, it still applies. They reordered this sentence if all or part of the hand is exposed in error, the player's disqualified. So that is under number one. And then finally, if there are three disqualified players, which did not result from Mahjong and error, then the surviving player throws in their hand and nobody gets paid. That's number three. All right, let's dig into the nitty gritty analytics and insights. The hand count that I do with my analysis includes line level variations like evens number one. There are two options. So that means two hands were counted. Let's look at the values of the hands. 67% of the hands are easy. These would be the 25 point hands. 18% of the hands are moderate, and these would be the 30 and 35 point hands. 15% of the hands are difficult, and these are the 40 to 75 point hands. You can see a big chunk are easy. I think that most of the cards have this ratio. It's pretty close from year to year. There's enough challenge for experienced players with a soft entry for beginners. There are some valuation oversights that I thought I would mention. The first one is evens number five. This hand has a pair Kong, pair, pair Kong, so it has three pairs and historically this exposable hand had a 30 point value. You can see there's an example hand from the 2023 card where we have three pair in here, pair two dot, pair four crack, pair eight bam. So pair Kong, pair Kong, pair, 30 points. The same count of pairs and Kongs, but there's an anomaly with the point value. It is what it is. There's another one in any like numbers that I questioned. This is a 25 point hand, but with a pair of flowers and a block of singles, that's just as difficult as a hand with three pair. So this particular hand, I think, is a little more difficult than the standard 25 point hands. The consecutive run number eight and 369 number seven hands are concealed and there are 30 points. This hand has three or four pungs and a pair. The odds number seven concealed hand is 35 points and it has th four pungs and a pair too. So I'm not sure why there's a difference. They're gonna be equally challenging but there's a point difference. Both have one pair and four pungs. 
there are two hands that appear to have an anomaly, but maybe not. The first one is with quince number one. We have two pairs and two quince, but one of the pairs is a pair of flowers. This has a 40 point value. The next hand is quince number three, and it also has two pair and two quince at 45 points. But the first quint in this example, since there's a pair of flowers and there are eight flowers in the set, that might be why there's a point difference. Let's look at prevalent shapes. The most prevalent shape on this year's card is Pung Pung Kong Kong. There are 11 hands. Next, we have Pear Triple Kong, seven hands. Then we have Pear Pear Pung Pung Kong, five hands. We have Math Play this year, four hands. Pung Pear Kong Pear Pung. It almost looks like a castle to me. Four hands. Then we have Kong, triple pair Kong. I call this a gate hand. And there are three. Then we have three singles and pairs hands, all pairs. There are 10 shapes with two hands each. And then there are 16 hands with unique shapes. So it's going to take us a while to learn the card. Be patient with yourself and others. Let's talk about the path of least resistance. It's defined as the easiest way to continue. The path of least resistance, it's not laziness, it's human nature. The principle of least effort is A, a desire to maximize benefit, and B, a desire to minimize effort. There's no shame in wanting to take the path of least resistance. Why does this apply? Because there are hands on the card with shapes that I call hands of least resistance. These are any hands that have two pungs and two kongs. So here we have an example of 369 number one. Two pungs, two kongs. Pung pung, kong kong. You can use any number of jokers with these hands. We also have hands of slight resistance. This is when you have a pair with multiples for the other blocks. This is an example of odds number eight. We have Pung Pair Triple Pung. Why is this important? These hands are easy. Two Pungs, two pairs for hands of least resistance, or a pair and the rest multiples, hands of slight resistance. Also, they're plentiful and they're relatively indestructible because for hands of least resistance, you can use any number of jokers in those hands. If you have the pair in your hand for hands of slight resistance, then you can use any number of jokers for the rest of the hand. They're both relatively indestructible. So when would you wanna play these kinds of hands? Anytime you feel yourself getting frustrated discouraged, or overwhelmed. Playing these hands could, could help you avoid going on tilt. That's just where maybe you let your emotions get the best of you. Perhaps you're not winning as much as you expect. Consider playing hands of least resistance or hands of slight resistance. Also, there are some sticky notes on Amazon that I recommend. These are removable and they can help you find those hands quickly. Let's talk about patterns. The pattern of a hand can be described by its components. 
the shape of this hand is single pair Kong, single pair Kong, and the pattern is two like sequences of three. This year there are 23 unusual patterns, so check your hand before you commit to your first exposure. Now we're going to look at the significant attributes of the hands on the card. And this is really important when you develop your hand because you want to optimize your potential to win. The first thing I want to share is that wins are in 13 hands. That's 18% of the hands on the card. Dragons are in 19 hands, 26%. There are six more hands with dragons than there are wins. So consider passing wins before you pass dragons during the Charleston. Kongs of flowers are in nine hands. That's 12%. There are also hands with pairs of flowers, 21 at 29%. Together, that's 42%. 42% of the hands on the card use flowers, so it's best not to pass flowers during the Charleston. And also be mindful of discarding flowers in the end game because they're used in 42% of the hands on the card. Like numbers are in 32 hands. That's 44%. There are only three hands in the category, but they're all over the card. During the Charleston, I highly recommend that you avoid passing like numbers, if at all possible. In my opinion, passing like numbers is almost as risky as passing a pair. 51 hands are in mixed suits. That's 70% of the hands on the card. Compared to one suit with or without dragons, at 25%. 18 hands. My advice is to gather all the tiles that can be used in your category regardless of suit. And that way when you run out of discards you can decide whether or not you're going to play a hand in mixed suits or a hand in one suit. Just go with the predominant pattern. Big multiples. Those are Pungs, Kongs, and Quints are in 62 hands. That's 85% of the hands on the card. Little multiples, which are pairs, are in 47 hands, or 64%. American Mahjong is a game of multiples, so target multiples to optimize hand development. Target multiples and choose a category that uses most of the remaining tiles to support it. Gather tiles that can be used in the category regardless of suit. Build around the multiples to optimize quick hand development and defend along the way. American Mahjong is a game of multiples. Target multiples to optimize hand development. If you don't have multiples, target the predominant pattern. When a multiple forms, reassess and target the multiple. Let's look at the categories now. The category with the most hands is odds, 13 hands. But depending on what someone plays, there could be odds in their hand. For example, if someone plays like numbers and they choose an odd number, well then odds will be outside that category. So there are other options for odds. Next we have consecutive run, 11 hands, 15%. But there are eight hands that use consecutive runs in other categories. In Winds and Dragons, we have 10 hands, 14%. There are three hands outside the category. No year hands, though. For 369, there are nine hands, 12%. In Evens, there are nine hands, 12%. And also consider that evens will be impacted if anyone is playing a year hand. Evens use 2468. And this year is 2024. 
So twos and fours are going to be hot commodities. In singles and pairs, we have seven hands, 10%, no win hands again this year. In the year category, we have four hands, 5%, and year hands are going to be impacted by anyone playing an evens hand. The addition category has four hands at 5%, only one suit. There are also multiplication hands in evens and odds. So math play would cover all those hands, addition and multiplication. Quince has three hands or 4%, but there is a consecutive run hand with a quint of flowers. So technically there are four hands with quints. Finally, like numbers, three hands to choose from, but don't be deceived. Like numbers are all over the card. 32 hands use like numbers. That's 44% of the hands on the card. Gather and build around the strength of your hand. Choose a category that uses the strength of the hand with most of your tiles. If you are between categories or hands, choose the one where there are no gaps. Gaps would be, let's say you're playing three, six, nine. You have a lot of threes and sixes, but you don't have any nines. That would be a gap. So don't play three, six, nine. Maybe look for fours and fives and choose consecutive run. If the choice is equitable or if you have gaps and there's an option for consecutive run, choose it for flexibility. I have some bonus intel for you. We're gonna talk about the powers and pitfalls of each category. There are powers and pitfalls that apply to each category on the card. Consider these when faced with a decision to choose which category or hand to focus on. We're going to take a systematic approach, so if you have your card in front of you, you can follow along. The power for this category is that you can thwart others from completing the big year hand, the highest value on the card. This would be the last hand in singles and pairs. The pitfalls are that these hands use only two numbered tiles, twos and fours which leads to the other pitfall. Anyone playing an even hand can impact the availability of twos and fours. Consider playing this category if you have a strong representation of year tiles, twos and fours specifically, and it's always good to have a white dragon or two. If you're not playing this category and you're going to be passing year tiles, be mindful because year tiles are always going to be risky to pass during the Charleston, primarily because of the singles and pairs big year hand. After the Charleston, watch for white dragons if you don't have them in your hand already. If white dragons are discarded or somebody has white dragons in an exposure, and you're not committed yet, you might consider switching to an even hand or maybe gathering consecutive tiles and switching to consecutive run. This is why you want to watch for sixes and eights so that you can switch to evens or watch for threes and fives so you can switch to consecutive run. For evens, if you get odd tiles, you may have options in consecutive run. Evens uses fours and sixes, which are two of the most efficient tiles in the set. The pitfalls are that since there are gaps between four numbered tiles, switchability is limited unless you have those filler tiles with odds. Fewer tiles might be available for this category if they are also needed for year hands. Consider playing this category if you have gaps in consecutive tiles or more multiples with even tiles than odd tiles. Also, if you get odd tiles, consider switching to consecutive run, especially if you get fives 
since this is the most efficient tile in the set. Since there are like numbers in 44% of the hands on the card, you do have some potential to switch to another category if the development of your hand is impacted. The pitfalls are that the hands require one number in mixed suits. If you play any like numbers, number three, anyone playing a big news hand, so news multiples like the first wind and dragon hand, pung, kong, kong, pung of news, that can limit the availability of single wins. So especially in the begin game, watch how many wins are being discarded because that could impact that particular hand. There are three hands to choose from, but don't be deceived. There are like numbers in every category on the card except for the addition hands. Passing like numbers, if you're not playing in this category, will almost be as risky as passing a pair. Try not to pass like numbers. The powers in addition hands are that they're all hands of slight resistance, which means that if you have a flower in your hand, you are able to complete the rest of the hand with the help of jokers. Also, you do have some potential to switch to consecutive run and odds depending on which hand you choose. The pitfalls are flowers are in every hand and they may not be available. You got to have a pair of flowers for each one of the hands. The hands typically include singles or pairs and that applies to the multiplication hands outside the category. So if you're playing a multiplication hand in evens or odds, consider that you're going to need singles. The last pitfall is that Hands use specific numbers one through seven. My advice is have flowers in your hand before committing with more than one exposure so that you can switch if your tiles are being discarded or exposed. The power in quince is that you have the ability to use any number of jokers in the quince. The pitfalls are that a couple of the hands use pairs. My advice is to consider this category if you have big multiples and at least one joker from the onset, but of course the more the better. And also, if you're playing one of the hands with a pair, make sure that you have the pair in your hand before committing to a second exposure. Consecutive run, the powers are that it uses number tiles one through nine in three suits with flexibility of a five number range. The pitfall is that the availability of twos and fours to a lesser extent could impact hand development, especially if you think about the year category, evens, and I believe there's a couple of hands in addition that could impact consecutive run in the lower numbers. Consecutive run is the most powerful category on the card because it uses numbered tiles one through nine in three suits. There's built-in efficiency because you can move your starting number up and down if your tiles become unavailable. If you choose to play a hand in this category and you have mixed suits, keep tiles in a four or five number range around your multiples or predominant pattern for the greatest flexibility. There are more consecutive run hands than any other type of hand if you include the hands outside the category. So if you're in between categories with equal potential and one of those categories is consecutive run, go with the hands in consecutive run. Also, consider starting your range so that it won't be affected by anyone playing a year hand. So playing with a three, four, five could be impacted because fours will be used. So perhaps start your run at five or just be mindful of discards and exposures to see what other people are playing so that 
you're not going to be blocked from someone using twos and fours. Odds has two hands that use five numbers next to consecutive run that would be the most numbers within a category. The pitfalls are that there are gaps between those numbers, so switchability is limited. Consider playing this category if you have mostly odds and weak runs as an option, but if you get fours and sixes and have fives, consider switching to consecutive run because four, five, and six are the most efficient tiles in the set. Be mindful of singles and pairs in hands because there are two hands with new shapes, hand one and four, and then also there are multiplication hands with singles. Winds and dragons have a couple powers. There are five hands that use consecutive runs. Also, there are four hands of least resistance. Just as a reminder, those are hands with two pungs and two kongs. And with that kind of a hand, you can use any number of jokers. So they're relatively indestructible. The pitfalls are that the hands are not as switchable because there are only two hands outside the category using wins. Consider this category if you have a strong representation of wins and dragons in your dealt hand. If you're not playing wins, pass them separately and definitely one at a time. Passing a wind with a dragon and a number tile is okay, but if you pass two wins or a wind and a dragon, you're going to be increasing some of the risk in that pass. Try not to pass north and south together or east and west together. There are more hands containing dragons than winds, so also consider passing winds before you pass dragons. Once the game starts, after East discards, monitor the number of wins being discarded in the begin game. If too many tiles go down and you're not ready to call those tiles, and also, if you're playing one of the hands with consecutive runs, consider switching to that category, but do it before the middle of the game so you have time to gather tiles and build a different hand. There are three new shapes, hands three, five, and seven. So make sure you check the hand before you commit with exposures. The power in 369 is that the hands use like numbers. The pitfall is that there are gaps between the only three number tiles, so switchability is extremely limited. Although the category has a fair number of hands, it's not very flexible because it uses only three numbers that have a two number span between them, limiting your ability to switch categories. Consider this category if you have a strong representation of 369 with no gaps in your dealt hand. If your hand is not developed by the middle game, consider switching to any like numbers if you don't have exposures or you have exposures that can be used. There is a new shape, hand two, and a new pattern, hand four, so check your hand before you commit with exposures. For singles and pairs, the powers are that the hands have the highest value on the card. Also, the hands are concealed so you can switch to a related category if your tiles become unavailable. The pitfall is that the hands are shallow since they're comprised of singles and pairs. So if you switch to a hand outside the category, it will require time to build multiples. Consider playing a singles and pairs hand if you have no jokers and few, if any, big multiples from the dealt hand. Hands typically align with another category on the card, for example, consecutive runs, evens, odds. 
So if you draw jokers or you start building multiples, consider switching to another category before the middle of the game, which would be about 70 tiles remaining. The very middle of the game is 60 tiles remaining. So 70 tiles should give you enough time to switch to an exposable hand if you need to. The big year hand will not be as difficult this year, but it will still be difficult. So try to win this one early because everyone will be adjusting to this year's nuances and strategies. There are four new shapes in this category, hands two, four, five, and six. So keep an eye on discards that affect your ability to gather singles and pairs. Let's look at some of the problematic parentheticals. The first one I think is year number three. The limitation for this hand is that there are two offsuit Kongs. These Kongs have to be the same number. The flexibility is both Kongs could be either twos or fours. The next one is quince number three. For this hand, you must use the same two consecutive numbers in two suits. We have pair, quint, pair, quint, four, five, four, five in this example. So you would not be able to use, for example, four, five, six, seven, because the example on the card is that these like blocks repeat. So you have to use two consecutive numbers in two suits. The next one is consecutive run number four. This hand must use the same three consecutive numbers in two suits. Single pair Kong, single pair Kong. Same three numbers. So similar to the previous hand, you wouldn't be able to do three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight. In three, six, nine hand number two, the limitation is that the two offsuit pungs, the nines, must be the same number. The flexibility in this hand is that both pungs must either be threes, sixes, or nines. The limitation in 369 number four is that the two pungs must be the same number. The flexibility in this hand is that both pungs must either be threes, sixes, or nines, with, of course, the corresponding dragons. In 369 number five, the threes and nines are Kongs, and the pairs are sixes in each suit. I like to call this three nine with sixes in the middle. In 369 number six, two suits with a number of tiles, and any opposite dragon, that basically means that you have the flexibility of using either the green dragon, as in this example, or a red dragon. This is also known as an offsuit dragon. Singles and pairs number five, three suits with numbered tiles and opposite dragons. These are also known as offsuit dragons. You need two dragons. You can't have the corresponding dragon. They're opposite or offsuit. As our primary suit here would be the consecutive run four through eight in cracks. There are other visual issues with four hands in Winds and Dragons. This would be Winds and Dragons number three, Winds and Dragons number five, and there are two options for each line. The winds are compressed because they needed to include text in the parentheses. These might be a little hard to read, but know that Winds and Dragons number three requires either north and south or east and west with Kongs in two suits 
with two consecutive numbers. Winds and Dragons number five requires Kongs of either north and south or east and west with three consecutive pairs in one suit. Let's look at the carryover hands. The first one is consecutive run number three, pair triple Kong. And this could be either in one suit or mixed suits. The next one is Winds and Dragons number one. We have Kong, Pung Pung Kong, or Pung Kong Kong Pung. So only four carryover hands. That means we have a longer learning curve, but not by too much. Let's look at the fatal errors. The first one is a pung of flowers because the hands use either pairs, kongs, or quints. The second one is a quint of dragons because hands do not use dragons. During the Charleston, rarely pass like numbers, flowers, and white dragons. The reason for this is because like numbers is almost as risky as passing a pair. And like numbers are in 44% of the hands on the card. Flowers are also used in a lot of hands, 42%. And white dragons are a dual tile. They can be used as a zero or a white dragon. And also white dragons are used in the biggest hand on the card the big ear hand, last hand in singles and pairs. This is another reason why passing year tiles will also be risky. If you pass any of these tiles, pass one at a time to different players, if at all possible. Building your own hand is the top priority and then you mitigate the risk in each pass to the best of your ability. Sometimes that might mean that you'll need to pass something risky Hopefully it's because you have a well-developed hand and the risk will be worth it. After the Charleston, there are no safe discards this year because there are singles or pairs of every tile in the set. Survey the discards and exposures, then count the cost of discarding hot tiles, especially in the end game. Hot tiles could be anything but more so these tiles right here, flowers, ear tiles, winds, dragons. If you can account for three tiles, either in discards or exposures, that's as safe as you can get, other than, of course, discarding a joker. Here are top three mistakes a lot of people make when playing with a new card. Number one, passing risky tiles in the Charleston. Hold or make use of these tiles and pass them rarely. After the Charleston, if you're not playing with these tiles, discard them early. Number two, claiming a discard for an exposure on a concealed hand. Check the card before committing to your first exposure and you'll be all right. Number three, playing a hand from the previous year. Check the card before committing to any exposure. To help you build your confidence, I have three recommendations. Number one, focus on strength. For flexibility and to optimize quick hand development, target multiples. If you don't have multiples, target the predominant pattern and gather supporting tiles. When a multiple forms, reassess and target the multiple. Number two, practice makes progress. These are some great skill builders that you can do at home if you have a set of tiles. If you don't have a set of tiles, look for a link in the video description below for one I highly recommend. I just wanna briefly share about each one of these skill builders and incidentally, you can find them on my YouTube channel. Category modeling is when you create every hand on the card with your tiles at home. Create the hand as you see on the card and then modify it based on the text in the parentheses. Random pulls is when you take 13 or 14 random tiles 
and you practice identifying the strength of the hand. Charleston modeling is similar to random pulls because you're going to create a dealt hand to practice identifying the strength of the hand and then you're going to create a mock Charleston so you can practice decision making with incoming passes. Charleston chain reaction is also similar but with Charleston chain reaction you're going to look at your dealt hand pick a plan A and a plan B and do the exercise in two iterations taking photos along the way so that you can recreate it and work on plan B in the second iteration. Then you compare results. It's a great way to test your instincts. Charleston force is when you pre-select categories on the card and you force hands in just those categories while you do Charleston modeling. Charleston sprints is when you do Charleston modeling on a timer. You practice making quick decisions. For beginners, I recommend four minutes for intermediate players, three minutes, and for advanced players, two minutes. When you can get to that two minute mark, you can play online comfortably with a timer, but you could also maybe play in a tournament without breaking a sweat. Finally, solitaire, when you play four hands at one time, you've gotta be able to compartmentalize your decision-making though, because you're gonna see all four hands. But if you can do that, there's much that can be learned in playing a game of solitaire. Number three, Play often and observe. Play with peers to relax and have fun. Play with advanced players to learn by observation. Play online between in-person games and watch my videos. I just want to remind you that if you ever have a question about the rules of the game, go to Maj Life and query the wiki because you can find all the rules in there. And you can even find some strategies too free and on demand. You can find me on my website, majlife.com. I'm also on YouTube and Facebook. If you just use hashtag majlife, you should find me. I hope you found my analysis, insights, and tips helpful. To dig deeper, look for a link in the video description below to download a free ebook with all the nitty gritty details. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click the little gray bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos and you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next video, may all your picks be keepers.